Hi folks, I'm glad you uh, tuned in today. My name is Ron Buchanan and we're coming to you from San Antonio, Texas. I always say that because I, I get off on it because for all those years, it was always from Tustin, California, but uh, now it's San Antonio, Texas. We're uh, in the midst of a, a study on Satan. And I know that some of you, that that's not a very pleasant conversation. He's not a very nice guy, to say the least. And some might say, well, why do you waste your time on somebody like that or some subject like that? Well, other than the obvious fact of being for education and to figure out how he works and why he works and what he's trying to do, then that's about covers the basis. You got a Bible. Turn to First Timothy, chapter four. First Timothy, chapter four, beginning at verse one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if for no other reason than this particular verse, that's why we study this stuff. That's why we look at his character his motives, his methods. What vested interest does he have in us? We can't hurt him. We don't bring anything to the table for him. We don't make him richer. We don't make him smarter. So why does he have this preoccupation with screwing around with us? Well, we'll get into that. Last week, we started off with 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Very explicitly, it tells you in that verse, he is our adversary. He's not our buddy. He's not neutral. He's not some little cartoon character that we like to symbolize. He's our adversary. That means your enemy. He's out to get you, to thwart you, to destroy you, to nullify you, to make you ineffective, to make your life miserable, to do anything he can to mess you up. And then we saw last week, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, which said, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You realize the Bible never once tells us to beat him, to defeat him. It just says resist him for our part. Resist him, stand against him. It never tells us to beat him. We, we can't beat him. That's Jesus' job. Not ours. Our job is to simply resist them and stand against them. Well, the first verse we looked at, you know, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, what are some of these things? What does that mean? Doctrines of devils. Satan has a methodology. He has a pattern, and he doesn't really change the pattern because it has worked for 6,000 years for this guy. He tried it out on day one, a roaring success, and he hasn't really changed it. Circumstances might change, environments might change, technology changes, but the root source of his method never changes because he knows human nature like a book. So what are some of those methods? Well, 
the first one we saw last time was described in Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said? You guys have heard me say this a thousand times, this verse. I go over it and over it. It's like 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. There are certain verses in this book that bear repeating a thousand times. And this is one of them. Satan doesn't come at you like a Mack truck. He doesn't dangle sin in your face and say, gee whiz, you know, if you do this particular thing, it's going to ruin your life. It's going to ruin your testimony. It's going to ruin your peace of mind. It's going to ruin your reputation. It's going to nullify everything you've done in life, and it's going to thwart everything that you may do in the future. It's going to totally ruin you. Take it. Do it. Enjoy it. He doesn't come at it like that. He is subtle. It is the world of the slippery slope. All of us can relate to that. The slippery slope. Oh, try this. You'll love it. It'll make you feel good. It'll take your worries away. It'll put you in a state of mind that you just don't care anymore. All the problems, all the frustration, all the disappointments. Wouldn't you like some relief from that for a little bit? Here, take it. It'll take all those problems away. The slippery slope. You take it, and hey, maybe all your problems are gone. Maybe it does make you feel good for a while and then something happens and you go into a spiritual funk you get depressed again you get mad again you get disappointed again and that little thought in the back of your mind says gee whiz remember the last time you got in this mood what did we do oh we took this and it took that feeling away now whereas the first time he may have had to try this far to get you to do it Second time, he might only have to try this far. Third or fourth time, he doesn't even have to try. You go looking for it out the gate, and he's got you. The world of the slippery slope. You start down that incline, and it gets steeper and faster and steeper and faster, and you have no idea where it's going to end. We've looked at this a hundred times. Back in Genesis chapter 3, I might as well turn there myself. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God made, and he said unto the woman, the first words out of Satan's mouth to us, the first thing coming out the gate was not to say that, oh, God's a, a meanie or God's no good. The first words out of his mouth was to discredit or question, rather, the word of God. Yay? Oh, so positive a beginning. Norman Vincent Peale would have loved this guy. So positive, so upbeat. No negativity there. Oh, no, no. Yay. Hath God said. Ooh, and there's the hook. He's got it right in there, and he's going to pull and pull and pull until you've got no control left. So he discredits the word of God. Yea, hath God said? Well, he's not done. Now having, you know, broke the ice, now, you know, Eve's hook, line, and sinker in this thing. He goes on. 
Verse two, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the tree of the, uh, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Well, we've gone over this before. She totally screwed that whole thing up. God said nothing to do with touching it or any of this other stuff. He just said, don't eat it. So she adds to the word of God. She misdirects the whole thing. She misses the whole point and she screws it all up. Well, Satan picks up on this and he goes, and the serpent said, verse four, and the serpent said unto the woman, now remember, God said in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Woman comes back, he gives her a little two cents for her. And now, after questioning the word of God, yea, hath God said, You really think he meant that? You think he didn't mean something else? You think he was serious? Was he just using euphemisms or speaking in hyperbole? Um, who knows? But God said, Really? He goes from that down that slippery slope. The next logical thing is he just flat out denies the word of God. He calls, basically, he's calling God a liar. He says, ye shall not surely die. That's quite a dramatic difference. A step from yea, hath God said? There's a little question there little doubt in her mind. He gave her just enough rope to run with it, and she tangled herself up in her feet, and she fell flat on her face. Add, adds to the word of God, subtracts to the word of God, misdirects the word of God. He picks up on it. He goes with it. He shall not surely die. God so loved the world. Oh, God is a God of love, a God, a just God, a humane God. There's no way that God would keep his word. You need a new version. That version's no good. Let's rewrite it. Ye shall not surely die. And now he's going to impugn, first he impugns the, the word of God. Yeah, has God said? Now he's going to, he's denied the word of God. He shall not surely die. Now he's going to impugn the character of God. Verse five. For God did know that on the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. So in other words, God doesn't want you to eat of the fruit of that tree because something will happen to you. Your eyes will be open. So God doesn't want you to mess with that tree because he doesn't want your eyes to be open. He's trying to hold something back from you. He's not giving you the good things of life. He's not letting you expand to your fullest potential. He's not letting you be happy that you can follow life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. God's trying to keep you down. And then finally, he's going to get into the, the motive. Why does God want you to keep your eyes shut, as it were? Why doesn't he want you to be enlightened? Why doesn't he want you to know certain things? Why is he keeping them from you? The last part of verse five. And ye should be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see how he twisted this thing up? Eve got all excited because she thought she was going to be a god after this. I mean, that was the inferred promise. For God doth know that of the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan didn't really promise her 
that she was going to be a god. He said, you'll be as gods. Big difference. Big, big difference. She didn't pick up on it. She went with it. Woman saw the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She ate thereof. And that was it. Gave also unto her husband with her. That's a scary part too. Adam wasn't five miles away building a new straw hut for them. Adam was right there by her side. He never spoke up. He never jumped in. It was his responsibility. He completely flubbed it. So Satan is subtle. Slippery slope. Starts out kind of neutral. Then it gets worse and worse as it goes. But what else does he do? He is a master of misdirection. See, Eve was all hung up about the prospect of being a god. He never said that. He said he should be as gods. And then he qualified that one to the extent of knowing good and evil. He never promised her that she was going to get to create worlds or to create life or to sustain the universe and the molecules and so forth of a trillion planets and galaxies. He never promised her any of that. The only implied promise that he gave, you'll know the difference between good and evil. whoop de do. What does that bring to the table? Absolutely nothing. There is an old expression that says ignorance is bliss. What you don't know won't hurt you. So he uses misdirection. Enjoy the moment, he says. Don't worry about the consequences. Get grief. Life will sort itself out. You're in pain now? Take a pill. You're disappointed now? Take a pill. You're frustrated? I don't know. Beat somebody up. Well, whatever. Just live for the moment. I mean, we see this all around us now. Some gr group of people come up with the idea, well, we got to save the planet. Well, let's see, how can we save the planet? I mean, it's a mighty big place. There's forces in it of which, you know, we're, we don't do anything with. Well, I know. Let's cut out fossil fuel. We can do that. And then we're not hurting the atmosphere. We're not uh, polluting the ground. We're, you know, there's a whole lot of things that we bring to the table on this. Let's get rid of fossil fuel. And everybody says, yay, yay, let's do it. I'm going to cut my carbon imprint, their footprint down. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to use paper bags instead of plastic bags and blah, blah, blah. That's great. Until you want to grow some food. Most of the fertilizer that every farmer on the planet uses to grow food comes from an oil-based product. Every time you want to heat your house or air condition your house or run a car or drive, fly a plane, whatever it happens to be, it all takes energy. And the energy of which we're stuck with now is fossil fuel. In 100 years, it, the windmill thing could be the big deal. The little running mice or the hamsters in that wheel that it could generate enough stuff to go ahead and power your electric bill. But for now, we're stuck with what we've got. But those folks never look at the consequences. It's the immediate, it's the emotional. It's not the ripple effect. Ripple effect doesn't even enter into their brain. She was. If I cut off fossil fuel, I'm not going to be able to grow as much food. That means more people are going to die. Some people are going to say, yay, more people die. That's what we need. We need to call the herd. We need to get rid of a whole bunch of people. They don't bring anything to the table. They don't contribute. They just take, 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 waste, waste, waste. Let's get rid of a bunch of them. So they went on both ends, these folks. Satan is a master of this. 
Don't worry about the domino effect. Worry about how you feel right now. He's got it wired. He knows human nature. Well, what else? One of the biggest strokes of genius that he came up with, and this ties in with the first words out of his mouth, yea, hath God said. We're talking about God's word. There's two elements of God's word. There's the oral, the spoken word, and there is the written word. Well, Satan goes after both, but he was really effective when he came up with the idea of, oh, let's have a multiplicity of versions of this book. Some of might say, well, big deal. So we have more than one version of the book. What's the harm in that? It makes it clear to read for some people because some people can't get through the these and the thous of the Bible. Some people just, they can't relate to Old Testament characters who lived thousands of years ago. All my world consists of is the things that I can see and feel today. Give me a laptop or give me a, you know, a smartphone or give me something like this and I can relate to it. I can run with that. But don't give me this old fogey type archaic stone age stuff. It doesn't make any sense to me. So somebody comes up with a version. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. There is a version for you someplace in that world. There's a version for single men. There's a version for gay guys. There's a version for uh, women only. There's a version for ethnic people. There, there's a black version. I mean, just it goes on and on and on and on. If you don't like this study, you can find a version that takes out that verse that says, study to show thyself approved unto God. If you believe that Jesus was not born of a virgin, there are versions that say that he was born of Joseph, Mary's husband. I don't care what premise you have. There is a version someplace that will back up and corroborate your version. And now the church as a whole is confused. Which version do I read? One version says this, another version says that. What do I do? Oh, I know. I'll trust the preacher. That's what I'll do. Oh, yeah. What could possibly go wrong there? You are told to read this book. You're not told to just listen to the preacher recite this book or explain this book. You're to read this book. I'm going to strike a lot of people the wrong way. They're not going to like my personality. They're not going to like my looks. They're going to not like my speech pattern. They're not going to like the, the illustrations that I pick. They're not going to like anything about it. And they're going to be turned off on this book. Just because of that. That's why God says, you read it yourself. I just quoted a whole bunch of verses right there. Maybe you didn't like the way I said them. Maybe you didn't like the sequence of which you read them. Maybe you didn't like the accent of which I put on certain words within that verse. God says, well, then you read it. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Instead of relying on somebody else to tell you. Because trust me. Satan has somebody lined up to go ahead and tell you what this thing is. So a multiplicity of versions, it dilutes the word of God as a whole. Because one person says, well, that's your version. I've got a version over here that says something entirely different. And the fight is on. There is no central source of authority. That, that was the greatest stroke of genius when he came up with this one. The authority of the word of God is now dissipated and diluted and watered down. I can't just stand up before people and hold this book up and says, the Bible says. Because they're going to come back and says, yeah, but my Bible says this. Or that Bible says that. 
You see where I'm going with all this? Yea, hath God said? It never changed. It's the same basic thought process from day one. And it still works today. Questioning the word of God. Yea, hath God said. So the church as a whole now. Why, why is it that the church is so apathetic? Why is it that the church is so ineffective? Why is it that the church, this church, in, I'm not talking about this local church. I mean the church as a whole around the world. Why is it? That Jesus says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You make me sick. You're naked. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. And you don't even know it. Because we have watered down his word to such an extent that we're past that point now. We're past it. We're gone. Do you realize that both Adam and Satan committed the same sin? Both were created by God for a specific reason. Satan's purpose was to direct worship to God himself. He was the covering cherub. All worship in the universe. And there was, there was lots to worship God. There was all the angels, millions, hundreds of millions, probably billions of angels at that time. They were worshiping God. And the worship came through Lucifer, directed to God. That was his purpose, the covering cherub. He made Adam and Eve for dominion over the earth. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over the earth. So God rules the universe. He makes this planet and he's going to give control of that planet to Adam and Eve. Both blew it. Both were elevated and blessed by God. Satan is not a co-equal with God. Just dispel that thought right, right up. He gives God a hard time. God gives him an unbelievably long leash. He's got power over this earth. The Bible says he is the God of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus didn't say, no, you have no right to do that. He just said, no thanks. I'll get it my own way. So Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever term you want to call him, he is not a co-equal with God. He's not Jesus' brother. He's not God's son in that sense. God only has one son, his only begotten, that's Jesus. So there, just dispel this thing, no matter how controlling, he may be in your life, how pervasive he might be in guiding you or thwarting you or messing you up. He is not God. He is not co-equal with God. He is not a junior God in that sense. He is a created being who has control over this earth, which was originally given to Adam because he messed up Adam and Eve and he took it from them. But don't give him more credit than he deserves here. Both Adam and Satan succumbed to the same sin, which was pride. Geographically, Satan is in a position where he is directing worship to God. Physically, he is above the other angels as far as geography is concerned if you please around the throne of god he looks down at the other four cherubim around the throne of god so positionally he's higher in a geographic sense not an equal peer sense but being in that position it went to his head 
And he thought, aha, well, I'm directing worship to God. I'm positionally over the throne of God. Why not just be God? Why not just cut out the middleman? I'll be as God. Adam and Eve, ye shall be as gods. Same thing. Both reached for inequality with God. Lucifer, in the sense when he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I shall be like the most high. With Adam, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Both of them wanted something that God never intended for them. Both of them wanted a position that was not theirs to be had. Both of them wanted more. It was intended for them. Both of them fell. So what's, what's Satan's end game in all this? I mean, what does he get out of it, basically? You know, I've got no riches that I can get. He doesn't need my riches. I certainly don't have any looks for him. Uh, there's no intellect here that uh, he doesn't surpass me by a trillion to one. So what, what is it that drives him? He already knows he's not going to get heaven. He already knows that he's blown it. Now, he's going to go through the monkey motions. He's going to try his best still. He's going, to, he's going to fight all the way. Revelation chapter 12, there was a war in heaven and Satan and his angels fought against the, you know, the, the Michael, the archangel and his angels. It's going to be a big war. He's going to lose his butt in that war. He's going to get cast down into the earth and then boom, the second part of the tribulation kicks in, which the Bible refers to as the great tribulation. And all hell is going to break loose on this earth because he is not going to be a happy camper. So what's his end game? Uh, we know that he distracts. We know that he is in it for the long haul. He doesn't mind incrementally getting you. Last time we spoke, we made it very, very clear that his biggest end game, as far as you are concerned, is to nullify you, take you out of the game, get your eyes off of God, and get them onto your problems, or your desires, or your wants, or your perceived needs, whatever it might happen to be. He wants you to get your eyes off God and focus on you. I want this. I need that. I deserve this. I deserve that. Whatever it might happen to be. And if he can get you focused in that direction, then he has basically nullified your effectiveness as a Christian. You're not worried about your prayer time with God. You're not worried about your study time with God. You're not worried about spreading the word to somebody or being a comfort to someone or trying to draw them close to God through either experience or a verse that God may have given you. No, you're just all consumed with you. Oh, I hurt. I need. Nobody loves me. Poor me. And we go through life like that. And we see life like that. He wants hypocrites. He loves hypocrites. How many times, and maybe you said it, maybe you're still saying it. Oh, well, you know, I, I go to such and such a church, but there are so many hypocrites in that church. Oh, I know for a fact that, the, you know, so-and-so is, is cheating on such and such. And uh, so, you know, that they're stepping out on their husbands or so forth. Uh, this goes on all the time. And Satan loves that. Because now that fallen Christian, that weak Christian, is now the poster child for the devil. And how many other people 
who would have given their hearts and lives to Jesus are not because they're looking at that one individual who keeps falling and stumbling and fumbling around. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm not going to come to God unless I can really, really live it. I'm not going to be like those hypocrites in the church. Well, that's great. More power to you. I'm still hoping for the day that I can go a, a day without sin, too. It hasn't worked yet. Still working on it. He wants to keep you afraid. Afraid of life, afraid of what might happen, afraid of the unknown. You know, how am I going to pay my bills this month? Ooh, fear, fear, fear. Uh, what, what happens if this stage three kidney disease turns into stage four, and then it goes up to five, and now I need dialysis, you know, twice a week or so? Oh, gee whiz, uh, poor me. I'm afraid to do this. I'm afraid to do that. So maybe if I just fly into the radar, nobody will notice me. Oh, I don't want to stand out and tell somebody about Jesus. Well, there goes my chance of promotion. There goes my chance of uh, acceptance into the country club or the, the women's circle or whatever it might happen to be. Oh, gee whiz, I don't want to tell anybody about Jesus because they're going to find something in my life that they can pick at and say, oh, you're one of those hypocrites. And so Satan just, he just stifles us. He, he just breaks us down and breaks us down and breaks us down to the point we just don't, we don't function as we should as Christians. And in that, he's won. So he wants to keep you afraid. He wants to keep you nervous. He wants to keep you off balance. He wants to keep you ineffective. And unfortunately, that symbolizes most of Christianity today. There was a time I used to preach in the street. I don't really, I don't do it anymore. There was a time I, I've been kicked out of buildings and threatened and so forth because of the passing out gospel tracts. I haven't been threatened and kicked out in, in years now. What happens? Same thing that, you know, I just said that happens to everybody else. It happens to me too. I'm not the Christian I was 50 years ago. As far as effectiveness, I might know a little bit more now. I might have more practice in speaking now. The big deal. The effectiveness as a Christian, life just breaks you down. Satan just keeps on hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering. So what do we do? We just give up and die? Do we just hope and pray that the rapture comes and gets us out of this mess? Well, that's one option. Let's try another. Romans chapter 8. And again, this is not a new verse to those of you who have listened to me for any length of time at all. But we'll look at it once again. Romans chapter 8. Beginning at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's Satan's biggest job. To separate you from the love of Christ. That's what he lives for. And if not se separate you from the love of Christ, it's at least like we just got done saying, to make you ineffective, afraid, consumed by your own wants, needs, lust, have-tos, and so forth. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's a monster biggie as a question. Because you're getting hammered in all directions every day. So tribulation? or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are as counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, it says, in all these things, things that we just mentioned, killed all day long, distress, tribulation, famine, nakedness, sword, peril. He says, in all these things, 
we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. And until you get persuaded, you're going to be in this whirlpool of indecision, nervousness, fear, panic, and everything else. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels. That's what Satan, you know, it's cherubim, seraphim, angels. That's Satan's class. Even him. Nor angels, nor principalities. That's another designation for him. Nor powers. That's another designation for him. Nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. At the end of the day, you're golden. You may be ineffective. You may be nervous. You may be apprehensive, but he's not going to get you. One last verse and we'll close. First John. Chapter 1. First John chapter 1. Verse 9. Took me a long time to figure parts of this out. You know, I, I do every verse incrementally. You know, there, there's the obvious overt, you know, layer of meaning to it. And then as you age as a Christian, as you mature as a Christian, as you get more familiar with the word of God, then then the little part pops out of a verse. And you go through more life, experience, prayer, time with God, more reading, more studying, and then poop, pop, another little part comes out of that verse. This is one that took me a long time to get. One nine, first John. If we confess our sins, that's our, us. If we confess, that's our job, confess them. If we confess our sins, he, that's God's job now, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Now you see the two, we, we got two entities here. We got us, we got God. Our job is to confess our sin. His job is to forgive us our sin. But watch this next phrase. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's one thing to be forgiven. It's another thing to be cleansed. There are a lot of people that I'm talking to right now. You've committed sin. I don't care what it is. I mean, I mean just go down the line. Some of us have committed a whole bunch of them. Some of us, one or two. Some of us, every one that you can ever imagine. It's a mix and match thing. You have committed a sin. And maybe you have had remorse, you've repented, you've asked God in tears on your face before him to forgive you of that sin. And he has promised that he would. But did you also know that in that forgiveness, he has also added cleansing. And when you cleanse the dirt from your hands or the dirt from your heart or the dirt from your mind or the dirt from your body, when it's cleansed, it's gone. I suffered for years and years and years of sins that I had committed in the past, repented of, confessed, told God I was sorry for them, and God forgave me. But I never got to the point where I could, I could just feel that he had cleansed me from those. It didn't mean that the repercussions weren't there. It didn't mean that the feelings that I hurt weren't still hurt. But just between me and God, he had cleansed me, not just forgiven, 
but cleanse me. So if you as a Christian today are aware of the fact that you are ineffective, that you are getting hammered down, that you have succumbed to the wiles of the devil, that you have gone on that slippery slope and you're just going like a toboggan down the hill. And you've got to a point that you've asked God to forgive you and you've repented of your sin, but you are so ridden with guilt still. Guess who brings that to the table? That's not God. The Holy Spirit will convict you up to a point, but when you've asked God for forgiveness and you've repented of that sin, that's not the Holy Spirit hammering you anymore. That's Satan that's hammering you now. And so God goes one step further when he said, I'll not only forgive you, but I'll cleanse you and I'll give you a new start. I don't care what it is. Alcoholism, sex addiction, Drug addiction, just fill in the blank. Just plain old greed. Maybe you think that you're superior to somebody else because of intellect or because God has blessed you with stuff. And that puts you above everybody else. I, I don't care what the means is. God will not only forgive, but he will cleanse. Satan doesn't talk about it. Satan doesn't want you to really know about that. Heavenly Father, I'm not going to rehash this message because it hits me between the eyes. I will suffice it to say in this prayer that I know from experience, I know from having lived as many decades as I lived, that I am not the only one in this boat. Every single person that has heard the words of my voice today is to some extent or another in this boat, some more than others, all of which are being hammered by Satan, all of which are being reminded of their sin, reminded of their lack, reminded of their ineffectiveness, reminded of the fact that they bring nothing to the table. And their sins are paraded before them. Their ineffectiveness is paraded before them. Their powerlessness is paraded before them. And they are hammered and hammered and hammered day and night. And Father, if there's one thing, I, I know this thing was about Satan last few times. But Father, at the end of the day, fully on him, I couldn't care less. If I could impart one thing, one closing final thing to everyone that's heard everything that I've said on this subject, that is this. I don't care how powerful Satan thinks he is. I don't care how unstoppable he thinks he is or how relentless he thinks he is or how effective he thinks he is or anything else or how he's mucking up God's plan. He's thwarting God. He's just dismembering the whole thing. I don't care. At the end of the day, only you can forgive and only you can cleanse. And if I can get that to stick, in someone's brain, then I'll have done my job. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name.